in the gospel text that Elizabeth has just read for us, we get a great glimpse into the mind of Jesus, revealing a mixture of impatience for it to happen, for impatience for it to happen and the reluctance that is inevitably must happen. He expresses his burning desire that what he began at baptism, namely his sacrificial death, will be completed. And this completion will not be a smooth sailing one. It will be marred by discord and division, and no one will be spared. And he also warns his disciples that the same will happen to them. When this happens, not even families will, be, will not be spared. The disharmony that will arise when one member of the family opts to follow Christ. This meant that Jesus had to deal with the conflicting emotions such situations caused. But the result was peace for those willing to trust him long enough to get to the end of the journey. He was preparing them that following him, being his disciples, comes at a cost. Yes. Life experiences have taught us that there is always a price to pay for standing on principles. Faith communities throughout the ages have had persons who sacrifice something of great value and especially life itself for the sake of a belief, a cause, or a principle, and we call them martyrs. Yesterday, I had the opportunity with Reverend Winnie of participating in a procession and a commemoration of Jonathan Daniels, the martyr, and the martyrs of Alabama. Alabama. Yes. That's it. And as we do this, remember, I was transported back into my context, context where I think of the martyrs in the eastern part of South Africa, the martyrs of Bogotwana, and thinking again in Uganda, the martyrs of Uganda that these are the persons who've made a choice and who lay their lives for the sake of Jesus Christ. The result of being a believer and follower of Christ is that one stands in opposition of the values and principles sanctioned by those whose intention is to steal the joy and take away the life that has been given to us in abundance. It's not Jesus' purpose, nor should it be the purpose of any Christian or church to deliberately cause conflict, harm, exclude, or discriminate against others. At the same time, a follower of Christ does not avoid conflict at all costs. That will simply be another version of peace at any price, and this is not peace at all. Part of what Jesus talks about in Luke chapter 12, verse 52, when he alluded to the divisions in the family, is that those who choose to follow him, their faith is and should be anchored in the promises of God through Christ. Those who follow Christ are not sure what life will pan out, but they have faith that things will go well. There is a quality about lives in Christ which we cannot see or tangibly measure. However, we have the conviction that life is distinct, is of better quality, and is diverse 
because of Christ. And the evidence we have in our sacred text on all who Jesus chose to associate with. Those were the marginalized, the excluded, the forgotten. But in Christ, they had an identity and dignity. Living in the promise of the resurrection gives us, as his followers, assurance for meeting all the challenges of this life, both good and bad. And when all this happens, we might feel alone, but we are not alone. We are surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses. We look to those who have gone before us and rely on those with us now for their faith to strengthen ours as we follow Christ. Being a Christian, it is not a solo trip. Being a Christian is being part of a community. You are never alone. You are never left out or left behind. The author of the letter of the Hebrews pick up on this theme of encouraging and giving hope to a new Christian community that was having trouble staying faithful to their conversion to Christ. They thought following Christ means that they will be happy all the time, they will be rich, they will have everything that they needed. They thought carrying the cross will be very light. <laughs> but when they were in it, they realized how tough and challenging it is to follow Christ. Their choices to follow Christ caused alienation, contestation, and ridicule. They were called to persevere, even though they did not know what the future will bring or what lies ahead or around the next curve of the road. Continuing with the thought, the author of Hebrew the thought that he began with in chapter 10 about faithfulness or hope, the author of Hebrew has this idea of faith, of faith being looking forward to the future, looking into the unknown and then unassured, but trusting that even in the midst of darkness, there is light, that in the midst of troubles, there's hope. And he says that running with perseverance, the race that is set for us, we look to Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith, who for the sake of the joy that was set before him endured the cross, disregarding its shame. And I'm sure we know by now that his death on the cross was set aside for those who had done the worst of things in the community. The shame that the cross had until he transformed that shame into victory. In this sense, the letter of Hebrews encourages them and us in their new faith by listing famous saints of the Jewish tradition. It is like wanting to go and eat out you can look at the picture of the restaurant, but if you're like me, you want to see the reviews. Who has eaten there before? Did they like it? Kind of a reference thing. So that's what the, list, the, letter, the writer of the uh, letter of Hebrews says, that I'm not asking you to be Christians. Let me tell you of those who have been Christians before you and how their lives were like. And this list of witnesses include our historic men and women. It is not those that we read in the Bible, it is those that we encounter in an everyday life. Yes. The cloud of witnesses includes those that we might not like that much. <laughs> but some of them have helped us to get closer to God. Yes. Usually, 
we call this cloud of witnesses the communion of saints. The cloud of witnesses continually surrounding us in this life, even when we are not aware of it. In my context, we'll say, these are your ancestors. And now as he continues to write to this new convent, he makes them to realize that their Christian faith, it is not the latest fashionable or coolest thing to do at that moment. That this is a way of life. They are reminded that assured, and assured that their faith is grounded deeply in the heritage of their forebears. And this is done by giving them a glimpse of what the early church looked and felt like. When you get into a new community, especially as a priest, as a leader, or a bishop, for you to understand the context, you go to the previous minutes of the vestry <laughs> to be able to get the picture of the church that you're about to serve, the community that you come into. So the early church, as the, letter, as the writer of the letter of Hebrew puts out to them that this is not a holiness club. The people in that time did not study, worship, fellowship, and pray together as an end in it for themselves. It was not about them. It was bigger than them. These activities were used to enable them to open to God's movement in their lives, in their families, and their communities. So when we gather here, it is like getting a mandate for the next week from God on what we need to do. And God moved them in a mighty way. God moves and will move us in a mighty way when we realize that what we do together, it is being refreshed and recommissioned. So mighty that we see in our gospel reading today when Jesus warns them about the consequences of electing to follow him. Jesus was really brave that he had to touch the issue of mother-in-law and daughter-in-law. We don't go there, but Jesus did, so we will follow. <laughs> the unity of the early Christian allowed the Holy Spirit to move powerfully and touch the lives of thousands of people outside the community of faith at that time. And the writer of Acts says that many people were drawn into the fellowship of the Christians and received the gospel of Jesus Christ. They were drawn in by seeing what those who come to church do. They wanted to be part of that community. So this is a new marketing tool for the church. We don't say much on our marketing strategies and say, Willie has just to prepare you that when you go out, you tell people how amazing God is working here in St. Luke's. Mm -hmm. And this is how we draw many to Christ. This fellowship of Christians, this communion of saints, is not a perfect fellowship. If you are seeking perfection, please don't come to church. <laughs> the communion of saints is where God's spirit nurtures God's people and cause them to grow stronger in their faith and works. The communion of saints is also the channel through which the Holy Spirit moves to proclaim the gospel, reach people, and changes life. For us to be a community of saints, we need each other. As he continues and concludes, 
The author of Hebrews reminds us in this day and time that through the challenges and the questions we ask and the confusion in our minds, that even through those things, God in Christ is always with us. And we live confident in the promise of God that we are the beloved, all of us, made in the image and likeness of God. And because we are made in the image and likeness of God, there will be nothing that will separate us from the love of God. So being a follower of Christ, it is not easy. And at those times, we want to give up. We want to change churches. We want to change denominations. We want to take a fed up leave from God and church. We are reminded that we are not in this alone. We are surrounded by a gray cloud of witnesses so that we might run the race of life with faith in God and God's promises. So we look back on this day to those who have gone before us, our martyrs in the faith, and we rely on those who are with us in this time and space to strengthen our faith as we follow Christ. So as the duo Mary Mary said in one of their songs, I just can't give up now. I've come too far from where I started from. Nobody told me the road will be easy. And I don't believe God, believe God has brought me this far to leave me. So in the confusion, in the unknown that you find yourself, you are not alone. There's a cloud of witnesses around you, and God loves you that much not to leave you to fend for yourself. Amen. <laughs>